Hi, everybody. A lot of people that know me are aware that I'm obsessed with brain science and how that affects the way we see reality. Uh, I am also really excited about how reality really works, because if we're going to strategize for technology or strategize for anything really about our future, understanding the basic laws of consciousness uh, and how reality actually is built and stacked is really important. Sandy Sedgbeer introduced me to Joseph Selby, said, you two have to meet. Uh, he writes books about the physics of spirituality, the physics of God, the physics of miracle healing, the physics of um, breaking through the limits of the brain is another one of his books. And we were just scheduled to do a meeting. And all of a sudden I was like, hey, Joseph, do you mind if I hit record? And I did hit record, and this is what he shared about his journey uh, and, and what he tells people about physics. And one of the interesting things he says is that you and I, everyday people, are operating with the, the understanding of physics that was 100 years ago. So we're still catching up to the fact that a lot of the wisdom traditions are um, being reinforced right now with our knowledge of physics check this out so you have you know billions of people who rely on science or what they know of science or what they think of science to inform their worldview and that translates to their life view to their health view to their mind view but that science is interpreted by most people in a very limited way, very material way. So what I've tried to do in all my books is say, no, there's another profoundly more expansive view of reality that is also based in science. And that physics is really that frontier kind of discipline that most people kind of sort of know has made all these amazing discoveries but they don't really know what they are, how they fit together, and especially how they have anything to do with consciousness, with health, with their own awareness. So at the most fundamental level, what I try to do with my books is allow people to believe in a reality that embraces much more than they think science allows. And so it's pretty conceptual. It's pretty abstract. I don't get into a lot of, and here's what you do with this knowledge. Pretty, trying to think if there's any exceptions. I guess my very first book about the yugas, I didn't include it. But in my book, The Physics of God, in my book, Break Through the Limits of the Brain, in my latest book, The Physics of Miraculous Healing, I always include meditation and how central meditation is to changing beliefs, to raising your energy, to uh, connecting to spirit. And that that is within everyone's wheelhouse. You know, as you say, everything you're talking about, you want to, people to understand that um, they too can do it. I mean, you don't have to be some extraordinary individual to make use of these. So that's the way I approach meditation. Meditation is as fundamental as exercise is to keeping the body fit. And meditation is central to uh, exercising your consciousness, expanding your awareness, to connecting to spirit. So that's kind of my my approach and what I offer people in my books. So, so there's a difference between a conceptual understanding of, okay, I understand that someone did a miracle healing, that it might be possible, that there's extraordinary things, but how, is there some sort of memory that has to be overridden over time in order, or it doesn't have to be over time, but 
what prevents us from experiencing extraordinary reality even if we know what you what what the, the, the those things are true well twofold one which is the i would say the the most accessible thing that we can work with and change which is quite simply do we believe it's possible if we don't believe it's possible we won't go there right it's axiomatic so again central theme with all my books is uh yes it is possible and much more is possible than most people even begin to imagine so open the door to possibility and then try to enter it the second thing is a certain amount of training is required to overcome the way your uh, neural circuitry is already working for you or not working for you. That meditation, among many other things, uh, rewires the brain. It, it changes actual uh, neuronal synaptic circuits that tend to support not only um, the simple physical things that we have to do, like how we move our bodies, how we walk, talk, run, which is very fundamental. We start learning that when we're children, but we also develop um, circuitry that supports certain beliefs, certain emotional responses. And those have a physical reality, even though what they trigger is a non-physical experience. So we need to retrain, rewire what we already have, because what we're already experiencing for most people is preventing them from having these more expansive experiences, right? So, so it it's twofold. You got to be open to it, and then you've got to realize that there's a certain amount of um reprogramming, re, uh, I try to avoid the word reprogramming, but it's so irresistible that it pops out. But I don't believe our brains are computers. I think that is a myth that is getting in the way of a deeper understanding of what we really are. If I have to use an analogy for what the brain is, I would say it's a switchboard and it switches us it connects us to higher consciousness or it connects us to the muscles and nerves that are allowing us to move our body. But in either way, it acts as a connector to various things that we can do, including higher consciousness. But higher consciousness um, is not created by the brain. We don't have some uh, computer-like programming happening between all of our circuits in our brain that creates consciousness. Consciousness creates the brain. We will have consciousness even when we die. We'll have the same consciousness even when we die. Near-death experiencers often are surprised by the fact that they're still who they are without a physical body. They think in the same way, they have the same memories, they feel in the same way. All of those things may be elevated by their experience, but the fundamental abilities are all there already. They don't have to relearn how to think because they don't have a brain. They don't have to relearn how to feel because they don't have a brain. So our brain is just connecting us to mind and mind is already there. So, so what would, if people could understand your books and, and, and put everything in practice, where would our society be like when we go into this more unlimited way of being, what is there for us on the other side? Well, if you start believing in infinite potential, which is in a way, what I'm trying to get people to understand is that they do have infinite potential and they're just not taking advantage of it. 
catchphrase I use in all my books is that we are so much more than we know. But we're limiting what we want to know, what we're choosing to know. So there really is no limit to what we can become if we open to that possibility. But we have to open to it and then we have to retrain. We have to uh, rise into experience that is already innate to us. We just haven't reached out and embraced it yet, tried to experience it yet. Now, I tend to think that that experience for, the, for most of us, certainly was true for me, gradually builds that it isn't necessarily some amazing transformational experience where you're a fundamentally different person with fundamentally different perceptions, but that can happen. I just don't think it happens to most people. I don't like to set people's expectations that they can become this amazing unlimited being tomorrow because most people don't become it tomorrow and maybe that's discouraging, right? So I tend to say your potential is unlimited, but it's up to you to tap into it. And here are the tools that will help you tap into that. Yeah, I think there's something to be said about that, because even in my own life, I can see how amazing things can be. So you have an expectation and then um, then there's where you're at right now and what you're getting in your reality. And so it can be uh, discouraging when there's too much of a gap there. But then again, it's always, I guess, important to remember that things can change on a dime. If you're consistent with things, you know, that big opportunity or that big thing is, is exponentially now about to happen, right? right? Some people say there's 72 different realities possible in any moment. So you're, you're calling down some of the low, and we do this together as a society, you right. know, right? So, you know, we have, I think we have access to that kind of change, but what we may underestimate and may not really want to embrace because it's kind of what discourages us is that we've already uh, created neural circuitry that enables habitual access to those realities. Now that's the good news. It's kind of like once you learn to tie your shoes, you don't always have to sit down and think through how to tie your shoes, right? It would drive you crazy. So you have a neural circuit that just kind of does that while you're thinking about something else. That's the good news. The bad news is that you're brain is triggered by your everyday life, by occurrences in your everyday life, that will automatically throw you into those states of consciousness that you've already uh, created support for. That's sort of good news, as long as what it's throwing you into is a state of consciousness that you want. But if you want to change, you have to, I think, be realistic about the fact that you've embraced these other states of consciousness. They will tend to come back automatically. And that you need to build new circuitry. You need to form new habits. You need to establish that same kind of um, automatic connection to the higher things that you want, higher abilities that you want. But you have to do that methodically and deliberately and make it happen and not be discouraged if you get thrown back into um, previous states of awareness and behaviors. They all come together, behaviors, thoughts, feelings. 
they all are a bundle, right? And you get kicked into them by certain triggers. So make new triggers. That's basically what I say to pay people. Make new circuits, be deliberate about creating new states of consciousness, which again, key to that is meditate, feel spirit, feel the unlimited nature of your soul. And it becomes more and more real to you, more and more easy for you to accept that you can have that experience. And while you're doing that, your brain is going, ah, okay, we can support this experience. All we'll set up a neural circuit in our brain that's connected to all the right parts of the brain that need to be activated to support this experience. And then it becomes your friend, right? Then these neural circuits become the best friends you have and they gradually become more triggerable, they become more powerful than the circuits that you uh, built previously that may not have been so positive or may just have been neutral. So you're remaking yourself with all these tools, remaking yourself to be an, a person who can automatically, habitually, daily kick into those kind of experiences. At any time, like you say, in the right workshop with the right people, you can have experiences you've never had before. And they give you that belief and they give you that um, experience in the now that can be transformative. But then what I think many people have as the common experience after that is they find it not so automatic to have that experience again. So yeah, I think you need both. I mean, I think you need the kind of wonderful work you're doing and more that allows people to have an experience that they wouldn't otherwise believe is possible. But then I, what I encourage people to do is, is also roll up your sleeves and do the day-to-day -day work to get back to that experience, to make that a normal everyday part of their life. Yeah, that's interesting. So I guess what you're saying in the physics of miracle healing and things like that, you've got these healers that are, that believe in them. They're in, not their invincibility because they're, they're, you know, probably not that arrogant, but um, in their, in their minds, right. They know that they can produce this result when they're in a healing situation. So I have a couple questions for you, but you're opening up a whole, you know, thing that you're encouraging people to say, Hey, okay. Meditation is actually the daily thing that, you, that you're going to do to connect to this thing, to connect to your unlimited self, to connect to source, connect to rewiring your brain. What does meditation look like for you? Do, do you go somewhere specific? Um, and are you in that garden or that place? Or do you allow your, like, how, how do you do it? What's your method? I'm going to give you a non-answer, but on purpose, which is meditation is a little bit like eating. So if you ask somebody, well, how do you eat? They would say, well, I mean, I eat all kinds of food. I cook all kinds of recipes. I have all kinds of wonderful sensory experiences that are a, a combination of a lifetime of eating. So meditation can put you in in contact with many, many different experiences. And sometimes you can be deliberate about that and sometimes it's serendipitous. So the one common thread to the techniques I use and how I'm trying to um, guide myself while meditating is I wanna get to physical stillness and inner absorption. That's where I try to go. Now, I almost fail every day at that. And for the most part, I fail at ever having complete physical stillness or complete inner absorption. But the more still 
I become physically. And the more able I am to stop thinking about what's happening in my life, get inwardly absorbed in my potential, get inwardly absorbed in the feeling of spirit, in the presence of God, in the, the love and the joy and the bliss that is our source. And there's a million ways that you experience that and it never stops being different. And yet at the same time, it never stops being the same. You always know that you're connecting to this amazing transformative reality that is what you really are. But it's never the same and you never get to it the same way except those commonalities that you're trying to and you're learning to sit still. And then I throw in a third element, which is that I, I practice Kriya Yoga and Kriya Yoga is a pranayama technique. And it's something that um, you learn in our particular teachings. Uh, I'm a member of Ananda, which is uh, you know directly inspired by Yogananda. And you learn a number of techniques that will help you achieve that physical stillness and inward absorption. But Kriya is a pranayama technique that is particularly effective to take you deep in both those directions. It tends to make you be able to sit still really effectively and it brings your breathing down to profoundly slow states. And as your breathing slows and becomes even unnecessary, then you can have really deep, marvelous, amazing spiritual experiences because you're, you're leaving the body and thoughts behind. And when you're able to do that, what's automatically there, you don't have to work at it. You don't have to create it. You don't have to make it happen. What's automatically there is bliss, is joy, is amazing inspiration. I mean, all of my books come to me from that state and ideas flow in. It's almost like a download. It isn't a download uh, as is often used to describe people getting inspirational experiences, but I feel the truth of it. And, but I also apply that to after reaching that state and just kind of immersing myself as much as possible in that feeling of spirit, in that expansion, in that love of spirit. Sometimes I just want to stay in that, but I know also it's part of my brain that uh, my mind really that kicks in and says, well, okay, meditation's going to end soon and we're going to have a day. We're going to, we're going to do our day. So this has happened already to me this morning. And part of it was, oh, I'm meeting with Zenka. So what does that mean for me? And um, I had already taken the time to look at your website and get some feeling for what you do. But what I really wanted was, you know, is there something that is going to download here that gives me some direction, give me some inspiration for what this meeting with Zinka might mean or could mean. And what I got was just be open. It's just who knows where this is going to go that I could already tell from the way you wrote, the way you looked in your website, that you were going to be the kind of person I'm experiencing right now, bright, full of life, full of energy, very intelligent, very um, energetic. So that just said, you know, stay with that, see where it goes. With other things that I have to do today, I got new ideas that I'm, I'm putting together a presentation for a talk on the yugas. And I'm 
maybe a quarter of the way, a third of the way through putting together a PowerPoint to support that. And kind of like the next step in that presentation clarified for me what I need to say, how I need to say it so that I can move through to the end. So <clears throat> it's everything. So I say you could complain, you could compare meditation to eating in that it's such a varied experience and you have so many experiences over a lifetime of different tastes, different kinds of foods in different restaurants, you know, that's it's hugely varied. But the common denominator is you're eating. <laughs> right. So the common denominator for me is that I'm meditating, but I have this enormous um, breadth of experiences that come to me. So does that answer your question or not? Answer your question? You know, I have been working with um, in our purpose lab. So one of the things we're doing right now is helping people find their purpose because we feel that that is where your superhuman abilities come out because you're raising the vibration of everything around you because you're in that closer to that bliss state you're talking about. And I've been working with um, Tim Kelly, who's the founder of the True Purpose Institute, and he helps organizations like IONS, even countries and individuals um, really tune into their purpose. And his core theory is that if you're up to something big in this world, you have to have a trusted source. Like you're mm -hmm. saying, you know, you're tapping into your trusted source. And he's like, you know, who's your trusted source? And I was like, well, I've been resisting this my whole life, but I'm just going to say God, because that's basically what it is. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, I don't see it as a multiple entities that there's gods in the tree. You know, I don't know. It's just easy for me to focus to one point. And so I was like, okay, God. And so we worked out my purpose and my purpose is to be God's lucid dream. Mm -hmm. And we work a lot with uh, lucid living, which is bringing the lucidity of your dream into your waking regular life. If we're even awake right now, which I'm not entirely sure we are. So when we look at our everyday life as the dream, and we look at it as, as knowing that we have the capabilities to kick those tires out a bit, because as in your books and the miracles and the things that you're documenting, there is no limits to even this part of it. It's only right. in our minds, right? So, and Dr. Sue um, Mortar the other day said that the veil that we talk about is our mind our mind doesn't really, like you said, it's like accommodating the fact that this is way more flexible, pliable than we thought it was. But I also, so Tim has encouraged me to sit down, have appointments, <laughs> meditation appointments with God and say, okay, you got, you know, and so I write this, I write a question, you know, like, okay, Joseph, you know, or, or whatever. And, and I get these responses and they don't seem, you know, he has, he has metrics of 20 different ways that you can test. Is this, are you talking to your trusted source, whether it's Buddha, Yogananda, whatever, um, Eagles, mother nature, it, it, people have different ones, right. But, he, you know, he has this methodology to, to make sure that you are actually talking to a, your trusted source. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been very interesting and uh, and you certainly can get all of the guidance. That's, I think what you're encouraging people to do is to get on the road because right. once you're on the road, you, you cannot fail in a way because you're always gonna get that step-to-step, -step, minute to minute guidance and it is gonna blow your mind because the right. stuff that you experience is inevitably beyond what you could have drummed up. Like that's one of the things <laughs> right. that has been surprising to me. Like, wow, I didn't know it could be this good. Or I didn't know that that, that big of a thing could, to, could occur. Right, right. Yeah, I'm trying to reach people who are hesitant to get on the road because they don't think there is a road. Yeah. That they're stuck in what society seems to be reinforcing constantly is the only reality possible for them. 
uh, of which they're probably making the best that they can. But um, in the back of their mind, if they think about it at all, I think, well, you know, all those people are probably well-meaning, but they're probably misinformed or crazy. And there is no God and there is no higher potential because science tells me that. So those people I want to reach and say, no, no, there really is a road. There really is another reality because even science supports it. And in fact, science almost insists on its reality. And so, yes, get them on the road and start giving them some pointers to um, how they can move along the road is kind of what I'm doing. That's, that is in a big way how I see what I can do for people. But once people are on the road, as you're expressing, the road is amazing, fun place, right? And it can take you anywhere. Um, kind of like, you know, Dr. Zeus. So the places we will go, it is unlimited uh, in its potential. And everyone is unique and everyone expresses it in their own particular ways. So it's wonderful. But that's been my whole life is being on the road. And, you know, I could talk about that, how, how it, my experience of it was and what was great about my experience, what was hard about my experience. But mainly my personal mission is to get people past any blocks they have that science limits them to being material beings and embrace themselves as unlimited beings. That's that's my thing at this point in my life. Yeah, that's really cool. And I, that was one of the questions that was popping in my mind for you is you talk about the physics, the physics, the physics of God, the physics of healing. What about the physics part? Why physics? Well, what do you, what is your core understanding of that? Because you said that was one of the fields that is that crack in science that helps us be a little bit more up to date. <laughs> yeah. Well, in terms of most people's understanding of science and even the fundamental tenets of modern medicine are a hundred years out of date. 100 years or more out of date. Physics has just kept going on since the beginning of the 20th century into relativity, which says all matter is energy. I mean, the implication of the fact that there is no such thing as matter is profound, but most people don't give it any attention, right? Because what they're dealing with is that matter is very real and it, um, you know, has a big impact on their lives. And so they relate to their bodies and the world around them as being made of matter rather than made of energy. Um, quantum physics, which came after relativity, says not only is matter energy, but that energy exists in multiple dimensions. And that there are times when matter is not being observed, where it behaves purely as waves of energy, and it doesn't even exist in the physical universe anymore. And this happens all the time, every day, every minute. When you go to sleep, even Yogananda supported this, that when you go to sleep, and this will hopefully blow your mind, your physical body disappears literally disappears, not just disappears to your awareness, but is gone and then it reforms as soon as you wake up because the energies that were making up all the cells and atoms in your body were behaving as waves while you were asleep and therefore they were formless. And as soon as you woke up and became aware, became the observer of your own body, then all those same energies began to behave as atoms and molecules. And it does so instantly. It does so beyond your ability to kind of take a quick peek and see if you have a body. <laughs> because by that time, you're already observing. You're already aware of your physical body. So this is mind-bending and something that I love to 
put out there to people. But that was from the 20s and 30s of the 20th century. There have been subsequent steps into the fact that we are holographic, that the information, that the template, the hologram that forms your physical body, my physical body, in fact, forms the whole universe, is existing in non-locality, exists in a pure energy realm. And the universe and our physical body is the holographic projection of that template, of that energy. So not only are we more energy than physical, we're being constantly created. Your physical body is being continuously from one moment to the next created. So what this means for understanding health and healing is that if you can change the template, if you can change the hologram, you change the physical body instantaneously. And the template can be changed through your emotions, through your beliefs, through your connection to spirit. These are your innate soul powers that you have and use every day. You can use them to change your physical body. So this is as bizarre as it sounds to most people and as sort of unbelievable as it sounds to most people is fundamental to modern physics. This isn't some weird guy who took a bunch of physics ideas and came up with his own theory and said, hey, we're holographic beings. No, this is fundamental to M-theory, which is the most accepted um, version of reality that exists within the world of physics today. Without the holographic principle, M theory would just fall apart as a conceptual framework. You have to have this holographic connection. So most people don't know this. I mean, you press you press button A and you're getting answer A, uh, which I give all the time, and I can I can keep talking about this for hours. But that's why I I love physics is because it is mind bending. And it's very, very congruent with spiritual teachings. So substitute template, hologram, energy body with astral body. And spiritual teachings are saying exactly the same thing. Your astral body is creating your physical body all the time, continuously. And if you change your astral body, you change your physical body. Saints, sages, psychics have, and near-death experiences, have experienced this. They've seen this literally taking place, and then they describe it in spiritual terms. Physics, by and large, physicists, aren't getting on board with the notion that what they've discovered a spiritual realm, known as the astral regions, right? But what they're discovering is very, very congruent and very supportive of that same vision. So that's why I bring physics in, is because physics, you know, I get to say in my books that Leonard Susskind, the most respected physicist alive today, professor of some department or another at Stanford, leading light in M theory says point blank that everything in this physical world, including our bodies, is being continuously created from information that exists non-locally, that's pretty mind-bending, right? So if you're skeptical about all this woo-woo spiritual stuff and you read that, my hope is that the skeptics will go, hmm, Maybe there's maybe there is more to this possibility of a a road I could get on than I 
was able to believe before. So physics is just fabulous for its congruence with uh, more subtle spiritual teachings. And in general, its congruence with uh, kind of the human potential movement, the human potential, unlimited human potential as a uh, different way to think about ourselves. It fits really well with that. That is such a, a great niche to be in and, and knowing, like you said, you know, we're operating, the everyday person is operating physics with physics from a hundred years ago. And that all these different theories, I mean, there's people that don't even believe in string theory that are moving on um, to other project pro holographic pro projections. And it's interesting how all this stuff has boiled down into pop culture. I mean, it's gotten to the point today. I mean, I was taught that you have a spiritual body, a mental, like your astral is, is actually, you know, it's nested. So you've got at the highest, your spiritual, your mental, and your emotional. And then, then the line is the projection that is your body. But, you know, when I am sick, stomach ache, back ache, this, that, whatever, I'm going straight to Louise Hayes saying, what is the emotional? Because a lot of it comes right from the emotional. It's, right. it's less common for it to be a mental, you know, um, distortion, and then even less common for it to be some spiritual situation up there. So, and inevitably, I look at the emotions that that are associated with her chart. I don't know if other people have innovated on top of that, but it's it seems very accurate. So mm -hmm. it, it helps to take care of it. So my question, and this has been a big question to me in my research as we as we've been doing this this lucid living. So we'll produce purple cars, or you know, we'll ask to see things in our reality that end up getting projected in our reality because we've given it a heightened meaning, meaning, and because we're on the journey playing the game. And because it excites us. So, so, you know, all of a sudden we see that purple car, we see the thing that we requested, the butterfly. Um, so we're kicking around this idea that this, that this um, printout of the hologram is actually, yeah, more malleable than we ever dreamed. And it's interesting because Lynn McTaggart is putting together those groups of eight that do the healing. So it's almost like if you can get buy-in from eight other people, it's one thing to be meditating by yourself in a quiet room. But once you get buy-in from eight people, you're not crazy, I'm not crazy, we're not crazy, you know, like everyone's buying into that, you get these miracles happen. Right. The person gets witnessed. Everybody saw that there's something happened, some caused this to go from state to state. And, you know, she and uh, we're working on a dream machine project where we're using this group um, efforting to to create new prototypes for our, our new world. Right. So and then she's using it as well, like this revolution eight, this idea that you can get eight people together and build community templates, build physical things energetically in this world that we want to improve our structures of education and, you know, mm -hmm. health and whatever. So. One of the biggest like confusions in my head is the fact that I believe because Adam and I do some like whatever miracle healing and it is pretty bizarre when you take someone from one point to another and I always think well it's not actually me there's another dimension of friends that I have guides that I have people ETs whatever angels all these other things energies that are actually also present that are also facilitating some of the miracles. You know, some people are like, oh, that's just your excuse because you don't want to take credit for it that in your head or, or something like that. But the, I tend to believe that because you started talking about dimensions and you started talking about, hey, this is actually a dimensional reality. So for you, what is on that other dimension? Is it that God is has some available outcomes that we don't consider because we're not really down with the love program that that is being set, you know, that is at the highest level of God source, whatever, that we can't really get there? Or is it that um, 
when we do these miraculous things, we are actually interacting with other dimensions that are working with us as we dream or as we live. Uh, I would say definitely yes to the the last thing you said that we're getting lots of help, whether we're consciously aware of it or not. Um, I'm you know steeped in Yogananda's teaching, so the uh, examples that I will give you will often come from those. But um, Sri Yukteswar, who was the teacher of Yogananda. Uh, said that when he when he died and went into his um, ascension, that he was going to be a teacher in a high astral planet. And that he referred to the, the luminous astral regions as having lots of layers. Now, I'm probably, you've probably heard this from other sources as well. But one of the other things he said is that the people who he would be teaching, working with, would be the astral beings who were just about ready to become totally mental beings, that they would have no form whatsoever, not even a light form. But what they would be doing, and this is what made me um, think of it, this example, is what those beings are doing to kind of work through their final training, work through their final release, is that they're helping with the redemption of lower levels of awareness. And they're working with receptive people who uh, they can guide and inspire in their own journeys on levels like where we are. And that, in a way, that, that what I came away with is the main purpose of souls when they're in these higher states of awareness, even if they're going to potentially reincarnate and come back and work on more of their own stuff. But one of the purposes, main purposes of everyone in these astral regions is to help redeem everyone who is in the lower regions. That you've got not just a handful of people helping you in particular, Zenka, you've got trillions of souls who are involved in one way or another in touching the minds, hearts, lives, purpose of everyone who can be receptive to it to help bring everybody back to God, to full God awareness, to full God realization. So I don't myself feel experientially that I have lots and lots of other beings helping me. I will feel mostly that I have Yogananda guiding me or Sri Yukteswar guiding me. But I'm also aware that that Guidance could be coming down, you know, through layers of people who are who are trans. Um, what am I trying to say? Transmitting that same consciousness that starts with these very high beings, and it works through channels that eventually um, I can feel. So, I guess what I like about this is that it's it's inevitable that we're all going to find God because the entire purpose of creation is that we find God and that we all are on that road. We all are going to travel our own road. That road can be fun, exciting, expansive, transformative. Uh, but we've got God and all other souls are pulling for us. They really want us to succeed. And so if they can drop the right idea in our minds or the right bit of inspiration into our heart, they will. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I would love to have you, Joseph, on our Unlimited show to talk about the physics as you know it, because 
if our brains can hold on to some sense of logic as we surrender <laughs> into uh -huh. this road is is really comforting to know that um that this is all starting to merge so our our inner world of meditation is starting to come into our our daily lives our dreams are starting to be that manifest so there's this the closing of the gap between our unlimitedness up there in meditation and our unlimitedness here in this world. And having people like you remind us that there is an incredible logic that's both spiritual logic and physics logic that is supporting these understandings um, and experimentation is really comforting and it's really encouraging to all the pioneers out there that are saying, hey, wait a minute, there's something else. And our lives are the printout. Our lives are the holographic proof um, that, that we have just scratched the surface of our potential. Mm -hmm. We haven't even really left the planet. Like there's so much more fun to be had Right. And, it, you know, if we're going to die every hundred years, that that cuts out a lot, too. You know, you know, so there's a lot in terms of our lifespan, in terms of traveling, in terms of getting to know um, other things that uh, and, and and the gloriousness of what even we could do on Earth if we stopped fighting, for example, and realized some basic things about are, you know, one, you know, so, so there's all sorts of cool potential. And thank you so much for helping through all your books, point us toward that potential by doing what everyone's craving right now, which is the scientific, um, you know, side of things and the spiritual side of things and saying, hey, wait a minute, these are saying the same thing. They're reinforcing and reflect, uh, reflecting the same truths. And those are becoming super evident and available to us all to say, what am I going to do with my road? Right. This lifetime. Well, I'd be more than happy to be um, on your program uh, whenever amazing. that is convenient. Amazing. Amazing. So thank you so much, uh, Joseph. We look forward to having you.